So our special guest today is Kevin Kennedy. Welcome to the show. Thanks very much. Uh, so tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, so I've been writing for about seven or eight years now. Um, started with short stories. I had never really written and I seen an advert on um, Facebook for a, an anthology. Um, it was a publishing company called All You Card Press. Yeah. Um, and it, it was Fifty Shades of Slay um, was the title of the book. They were looking for stories. And the advert specifically said, you never need to have written before you don't need to have been published. Um, so I wrote a story and I sent it in and it got picked up after a few months. Um, um, and I just started looking online for other anthologies that, that were looking for stories and sending them in. Um, I've done that for about a year and yeah. it was going okay. And uh, I just thought I wanted to do a wee bit more than looking for, for other, you know, a lot of the anthologies were themed. So I was picking the ones where I had an idea um, and I kind of, I wanted to do something a wee bit bigger um, and, and I'd sort of, um, decided to I'd, I'd been sending stories to a lot of anthologies and through that I'd met other authors Yeah, just kind of talking to the authors um, and I'd read some of their short stories and in turn that read me to reading some of their novels and their novellas and um, I quite liked you know I, I've always read a lot of indie stuff so um, as, I, as I spoke more to the authors I started sort of um, co-writing novellas with, with different authors so I've done that a few times um, before I wrote anything of any sort of length myself. Yeah. Um, when I decided to, to move into doing something a wee bit longer than the short stories, um, I, I had a lot of people... I had a, a story called Halloween Land that was about 8,000 words, I think. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people commented on it and the, the, the reviews for the particular anthology it was in. And yeah, I decided to make that like a, a full-length story. So um, I took that and extended it to about 24,000 words, I think it was. And that was my, my first solo novella, Halloween Land. Yeah. And I've continued with the short stories. I also quite like writing um, drabbles. Uh, for anybody that doesn't know, a drabble's a story that's exactly 100 words. Um, and I'm always looking for anthologies that are taking drabbles. I, I love writing them. Yeah. Um, some of the anthologies are really good, aren't they? Um, when you get writing, when you get into them, they can be quite, uh, quite good. It's sometimes if, if, if you, you know, I think some people have just kept a lot of ideas and decide to, to sort of sit down and write them. But myself, certain things spark ideas and, and one of the quick ways to do that is see, you know, sometimes I'll see an anthology and I like the theme. Um, other times I'd seen, you know, a cover that I really liked and I thought, God, I'd love to have a story inside that book. And it was as simple as that, you know, find out what they were looking for and, and send something in and hope that it, it got picked up. Um, other times it was invites. So, you know, the more short stories you get picked up, then there's a lot of authors that are, are doing the same thing as you. So you, you end up in the same sort of horror groups as them and writing groups. And yeah. um, sometimes they'll invite you along or sometimes a publisher that you've had a story or two accepted, you know, by before I'll invite you along. So I started to get more invites as well. Um, and I think like anything, the more stories you have out there, the more people sort of know you're doing it and the more likely you are to get asked along to other projects. So it, it kind of changes through time for me looking for, for anthologies to, um, you know, a, a new particular publishers that I would just be on their page and I'd see if there's something upcoming and, you know, other people inviting you along to their books um, that, that had maybe been in your books. As I say, there's a lot of crossover. That's good. So what inspired you to write in the horror genre, Kevin? I've always read horror. Um, when I was younger, I used to always read, um, everybody always says goosebumps, but it was point horror um, I read. I don't know if they were maybe bigger in the UK, but I read a lot of point horror books when I was quite young. Um, you hear people talking about the Scholastic Book Fair, so I used to come into my school and I used to get a few point horror books and and read them and sort of wait the next time it came round. Yeah. Um, but as I moved on to sort of adult horror, I think I was 15 and for high school I had to write like a, I think it was a two or a three thousand word essay about a book. And it was quite a big percentage. I think it was 25 or 30 percent of your full year's marks. Um, and I thought, well, I better, I better read a book. So I had a, a yeah. much for the sort of younger point horrors. And I, I picked up at a jumbo sale, I picked up a book um, called Darkness Tellers by Richard Lehman. 
Yeah. Um, who is one of my favourite authors, but that, that was the first sort of adult horror book I picked up. Um, and I grabbed it simply because it had a Ouija board in the front. I watched a lot of horror movies. I like Ouija board stuff. And I thought, I'll, I'll give this a read. Um, left it to sort of last minute and I had a few days left before I had to write the essay. And, uh, I, you know, I think the book was about 600 pages. It was massive compared to anything else I'd read. Yeah. I think I read it in three days. I couldn't have put it down. I was reading it feel like I come in for school, right till I went to sleep at night and then the same the next day. Yeah. Um, and I read it for three days after that. I picked up Ireland by Richard Lehman. Um, and again, I loved it. So I just started reading through everything he had written. At the time, Lehman was still alive. Yeah. Um, and, you know, but he, he was still having regularly. I think he was doing better in the UK. So he had a book or two coming out every year at that point. Um, and I probably had about 30 books to catch up on if you where he was at when I started reading them. Um, and, and that was, I, I, I read all Lehman's books and then I found, back in the day, a message board. There was a Richard Lehman message board. I think it was called Richard Lehman Kills. And um, the people on there who were obviously fans of his work had, mm. Um, gave me recommendations so I thought well they're going to have a similar taste to me um, and the main authors that at the time and, and it's 20 sort of 20 odd years ago maybe just longer um, the authors that were recommended a lot were Ray Garton Jack Ketchum Brian Keane and Edward Lee so I started reading their books and found I loved the four of them um, and they were all sort of quite indie at the time I think it was Leisure Publishing that was putting a lot of books out by the authors at that point um, part of Dorchester and uh, I just worked through all their books and then I found other authors like Gord Rollo, um, John R. Little and it just kept growing so I'd always read predominantly horror apart from the odd non-fiction book um, and I quite like Irvin Welsh as well so uh, but other than that I read horror so it was just the natural go-to when I seen you know I was in different horror book groups and therefore the advert I seen for a somebody looking for a story it was a horror story um, but it's the only genre as I say I really read so it's probably the only genre I'd be interested in writing in. Yeah so how do you come up with your uh, dark and eerie settings in your stories? Um, loads of influences, I suppose. Again, you know, uh, everybody's. You know, I, I read a comment a while ago to say something like everything's been written. It's, it's you know, people are like, putting your own ideas. That's how you write it and things like that. But um, you know, there's certain types of horror that I enjoy. It's always like post-apocalyptic horror. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I like all the classics, vampires, werewolves, things like that. Um, but, you know, there's certain things. I liked cannibal horror. Uh, I loved the House of Eyes movies when I was younger. Um, and then things like Jack Ketchum's Off Season. Um, you know, there's there a lot of good cannibal horror. And, um, I, I wrote a short story at the very beginning about the tale of Sonny Bean, which is a sort of Scottish, I don't know if you know the Sonny Bean sort of story. Yeah. Um, it was a, I think it was in the 1600s and it was meant to be a cannibal family. I think it's just a myth, but one of these sort of a bit like the Loch Ness Monsters, a bit of a legend as well. Yeah. And I found it really interesting, and I read somewhere that Wes Craven had got the idea for the House of Eye Horrors from this legend, the Sonny Bean. So I put my own sort of spin on it again. Um, but things like that, just stuff that's maybe always stuck with me, you know. Uh, it's something like, you know, I like Ouija boards, so writing a story about a Ouija board. But it's just always been stuff that, that I found fun reading other people's stories. And, you know, before I did write, you always have your own wee ideas. So, you know, you, you everybody's watched a film and thought, oh, it'd have been great if something such and such happened. Or, uh, you know, I, I would have finished it different, things like that. And I suppose with writing stories, you get to do it your own way. Um that's a good thing. It's telling your story the way you'd want to read it. If that's everything I do, I try and just do it the way that, you know, I'd want to read that or I'd want to see the movie. <laughs> <laughs> so do you find anything, is is there sort of like anything challenging with writing horror? I, I used to, when I started out, I found it really easy. I just kind of wrote stuff and sent it away and it, it get accepted or it get rejected. And I never really, I was, I'm not somebody that's faced that much if, if my story doesn't get picked up. Um, but I, well, a few years back, my, my father passed away and I kind of stopped writing at that point and I didn't write anything for quite some time. Yeah. Um, until I was going to, I was publishing a few anthologies and I, one of the 
my dad had done wee bits of poetry here and there through his life and I wanted to um, put one of the poems in one of my books that I was publishing one of my dad's poems and I thought well I want to have a story in that book as well um, just because it's a wee bit special so uh, yeah. I hadn't wrote anything in a while and I thought right well I'll write a story for this and in turn I wrote a story for the other book that I was putting together as well um, and since then I've been slowly getting back to it and doing I'd mentioned I like the drabbles are a hundred words so you know yeah. you you don't need to spend too long on them. Um, so I've, I've sent a few of them away that have been picked up to different books. But I, I, again, I've been getting invites to different things. Um, so sometimes, I'm, I'm, you know, maybe somebody's sent me a story and I'm, I, I want to sort of repay the favour and send them a story for their book and things like that. So I've been getting back into it. But that's probably been the main difficulty. It's not been um, with the writing as such. It's just been getting back to... I suppose feeling motivated to, to, to keep writing. Um, I've been distracting myself and keeping busy doing other things, but yeah. I've got some projects I'd like to move forward with. Um, you know, I, I was co-writing a second book with an author called Christina Berglund, who um, I co-wrote a book a, a few years back called, um, called <laughs> just my mind, Black Hair Creatures. So we had started a few years back before my dad died writing the sequel. And uh, he's passed away, and we've never, it's sitting sort of half done. So I'd like to get back to that at some point. Um, and I've been talk, bouncing some ideas about uh, another author as well, about something that we're hoping to start working on soon. Um, and the other thing that's been outstanding is the, the, the novella that I wrote, Halloween Land. Um, it, it was pretty popular. So I, one of the characters in it is ju- she's just called The Clown. Um, and she was really popular as well. She got mentioned a lot. So I, I I decided I wanted to write a prequel just about the clown um, and how she became the clown. Yeah. So I, I've wrote probably two thirds of that, and again, it, it came to a standstill at that point. Um, and I, I was enjoying writing, I just need to get back to it. So I suppose it's just been life takes over sometimes, other than anything particular about the writing. Um, I've still got ideas, it's just, I suppose, sitting in front of that keyboard again and, and uh, focusing. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Sometimes when life does take over, you do need the motivation to get back into it, don't you? Oh, definitely. I never done anything for about two years with the book stuff. I all stopped and I had books sort of half finished as well. That, and because I, I put anthologies together sometimes, um, I had other people's work sitting and I felt bad because obviously they were waiting and you were doing something with it. So that was what I had to sort of push through and get those books finished and out because it wasn't my stuff, it was somebody else's. Um, and I suppose it's the same with the book that's half written with with Christina I'd like to return to that I was really enjoying how the story was going up to the point we got to and as the life took over um, but I'd like to get back to that and, and get that out as well again um, the, the, the book was quite well received when we, we, we put it out so I'd like to, to do the sequel That's good So do you ever scare yourself with anything that you write? No, I think that's that was funny I've heard a lot of horror authors and, and even sort of horror fans talking about it, but yeah, I suppose you become quite numbed to any of it. Horror's that extreme these days. Um, especially, you know, even the movies, you used to never really see anything particularly brutal. Um, maybe back in the 80s, or the special effects weren't that great, so there was a sort of comedy value to some of the stuff. Um, I think that's changed as the years have went on. Uh, so you used to could read quite brutal stuff and, and visualise it, imagine it, but, you know, maybe no see it done that well on screen um, but I think horrors became quite brutal and there's a lot more extreme horror being written and released these days as well uh, I, I think back when I was reading you know it was like Rath, James White maybe Edward Lee were your kind of main extreme guys um, but there's a load of folk doing it now uh, so I think you get desensitised to horror uh, you know I just I, I just like horror the genre like, like <laughs> There's things like that, and I like crazy plots happening. You know, I've never been, I've tried multiple times to read sort of fantasy and sci fi books and things like that. And um, I struggle to, even if I'm enjoying it, I just sort of fall away from the plot. But whereas with horror, um, I, I, I've just always loved it, it just, it just works. <laughs> <laughs> so, how important is the research phase when you're working on a new horror story? I tend to um, stick to writing about things that I, I already know about. Um, I, I'm not a massive researcher. In, in regards to research, if I'm going to write, um, 
you know, if I want to do something, to, to, you know, like if I say, for example, I'm going to write a vampire story, then I might read a few vampire books. Um, but I suppose a lot of the time that's just because I'm in a, a, a sort of vampire mood. That's why I want to do the story in the first place. Yeah. And I've got a massive sort of to be read pile. Sorry, my cats are scratching them. Um, <laughs> a massive sort of to be. I, 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 like everybody, I think I've got thousands of books in my Kindle, but I must have about a thousand books just in the house, round about. And I've been slowly trying to whittle it down and sell books I've read and just cut back and get rid of some of the stuff that I know I'll never get a chance to read because it's sort of taking over the house. Um, so again, I, I'll use it as an excuse to maybe read a few books in the genre or something I'm maybe going to write. But I don't research as such. Um, I, I just sort of... I, if there's something I need to know for, for a particular part of the story, then I'll, I'll tend yeah. to get that. Um, but other than that, as I say, I, I stick to kind of things that I know about. OK, so have you had any memorable reactions from readers? I mean, just the reviews, I suppose. Um, I've... I've never done um, a lot of podcasts or anything like this. Um, and I don't, I suppose I don't spend a lot of time in groups and things like that. As I, I, to be honest, I, I work a, a day job, 40 hours a week, and then I've got my family, and then, excuse me, all, all the books, you know, all the time I put into the book stuff. So I, I don't have loads of spare time. So I pop in and out of Facebook and things like that. It's probably the main social media site I use. Um, but in regards to sort of getting feedback, the, the, well, outside the reviewers as well, um, because there's a lot of reviewers take my books when they're available on a, um, and you get feedback that way. Um, but I think, you know, I like to I like to look at the reviews. Some people say don't look at your reviews, but I like to look at the reviews in Goodreads and Amazon and, and get some feedback because if there's things that multiple people are saying, I used it quite a lot at the start. You know, if, if you had a few people saying that um, a story was too short, then I think, right, my next stories will be longer now. Yeah. Um, you know, anything at all, you know, too tame, then I try and make it a bit more brutal um, and, and things like that. So I did always look at the feedback. I'm, I'm not going to say I'll agree with everything that every person says, but I think you've got to account for taste as well. Different people have got different taste. You can't expect everybody to love everything that you put out. Um, I think that's why you're best sort of not taking it too personally. But I think it's valuable, as I say. I like to look at the books. I've never... Um, wrote any sort of long extreme horror, any uh, extreme horror or, or really brutal stuff I've, I've written. It's normally a short story, but part of a collection. Yeah. I'd be sort of sandwich it between a funny story and a, a, a tamer, cuter story. Um, they sort of soften it either side. <laughs> I found myself after I finished an extreme book fight, you know, picking something up by Jeff Strand that I know is going to be quite funny or something by Carol and Relic, and I think, you know, it's going to be wild, you know, but it's not going to be brutal to sort of cleanse your palate. Um, but I know that I, I love getting feedback, and as I say, there's never been anything that's really shocked me. Um, as I say, it's just been a case of keep keeping keep me on top of it. You know, I always look at sort of, and I used to more, you used to get your top 100 selling authors on Amazon, they've done away with that, but I used to always watch the market and see how everything was going. Um, and it's the same with your reviews, I think. If you're not listening to the people that are reading your books, then they're, they're maybe not going to stick a bit for very long. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. So have you got any upcoming projects or releases that you're excited about? I've got a ton of stuff. Um, the, the, it's all practically finished, but what happened was I was hacked um, maybe three weeks ago. I was hacked about three weeks ago and they got into my uh, Hotmail, my email account, and they got into my Facebook. Mm. So they basically blocked me from my Facebook. So the Facebook I'm now using is a new Facebook I set up about three weeks ago. Yeah. Um, and I had to sort of change my emails. I get they, they've blocked me from my Netflix, so I think I'm still paying for Netflix that somebody else is watching. And I've got a new Netflix account because they were really very helpful. So um, I couldn't get back on. But yeah. it caused me a lot of problems. Um, and I, I accessed other things like um, TikTok through my Facebook account. So I kind of got back into my TikTok account. So anyway, I lost a lot of access to social media and as I say, I've been at the writing now for pushing eight years and get, you know, followers um, and people that read the books or share the books or reviewers or whatever that, that I predominantly spoke to on 
Facebook. Um, so it's delayed everything for coming out a wee bit because I didn't want to release a book and have nowhere to share it. So I'm sort of, I've been building back up my Facebook account. I'm, I'm back into my Instagram. I'm not back into TikTok yet. Um, and, and sort of things like that have held me up. But yeah. everything that's coming out is is books, that, um, anthologies that I've put together. But I've got, the next one to release is called Vampires. Um, I'd wanted to do a vampire book for a wee while and I managed to get some great authors involved but I wanted to have a story in it as well as I say I've, I've not been writing quite as much so I wanted to get a story in that and, and, and sort of kick things off again so that'll be out within the next week ideally if, if nothing else goes wrong um, covers there it'll be out in Kindle and then probably about a week later for the paperback that's normally how how the, the, you know I, I, I work through things so the Kindle will go up first within the next seven days um, and, and as I say it's, it's got some great authors on it so hopefully that'll do quite well um, and it's got my new story in it as well yeah and um after that, I, I, I've done quite a few Christmas books over the years. One of them was a solo project, um, Can I Swear? <laughs> yeah. You can, well, the, the, the title's called Merry Fucking Christmas and Other Yuletide Shit. And it's yeah. totally an archetype me. Well, it's a bit bizarro and a bit weird. I, I really like Carrot and Melly because I said it was a bizarro author if you've never tried them. Um, and I, I released that book and it's got about, I think, six Christmas stories and a few Christmas travels. Um, but I've always loved Christmas horror. The first anthology I put together was a Christmas anthology. So um, I've done a few over the years and I wanted to do one this year. So it closed today. So that's me got all the stories accepted for it. And it's been getting edited as I've, I've been accepting the stories. So that'll probably be out in about three or four weeks. Um, I just want to leave a wee gap between releasing each of the books um, and then after that there is a, a, a run a horror anthology series called The Horror Collection there's so far been um, 15 books released in it so books 16 and 17 are finished ones are uh, the monster edition and it's all sort of creature feature stories and one is a, a, a horror sci-fi book. Um, as I said, I, I was never great at reading sci-fi, but I've read some horror sci-fis that I've really enjoyed, seen some horror sci-fi movies I've really enjoyed. Um, so they're the next two books that will release after the two that are coming out. So I've got quite a lot of stuff finished. I'm just going to be probably staggering the releases now every four weeks. Yeah, that's fantastic. I wish you the best with them. Thanks very much. So... What advice would you give to aspiring horror writers? I think write as much as you can. Um, at the start, it's a learning curve because you'll get acceptances and you'll get knockbacks. Um, and just because somebody rejects your story doesn't necessarily mean it's, it's, it's not any good. It might just not fit that particular anthology. It might not be that editor's taste, but somebody else might love it. So, you know, you, you can also submit stories to more than, than one open call. Um, often not at the same time, but as I say, if it's been rejected, you can send it away again. But I think as well at the start, sometimes that you're going to get stories rejected because they're not quite good enough. But it's like everything, it's practice. The more stories you write, the better you'll get. Even if a story is rejected, you can maybe just tighten that story up. If possible, always have a few people that will read your story. Um, I think the main difficulty is getting people that will be really honest with you because everybody wants to tell you your story's great and it's brilliant and people will love it, but that's not really that helpful because if you're honest with yourself, you need people to sort of critique it and come back and say, well, you never tied this bit up. What was the point in that? You know, you never finished something or, um, you know, the ending could be stronger. Or wee bits of feedback that you can go and look at it again and work on because I think when you write a story, and you read over it so many times, you sort of blurt it almost, you know, you're, you're reading it in your head rather than even seeing the words at points. Yeah. And you can start to miss things, and that that's just it. And probably as well, you're too close to it. So it's always good if you can get feedback from somebody that will be honest with you. And I, I, as I said earlier, try not to take it too personally. Um, but I keep writing and keep sending things away. For the first year, uh, oh, sorry, that's my cat came. Come on, you. Um, for the first year, I was constantly writing and starting to pretty short stories. I was looking for open calls that um, 
maybe only one stories about 2,000 words. Because it doesn't take a massive amount of time, but it's long enough to tell a wee quick tale. Um, and a big bit of the excitement is just getting that acceptance and knowing that you're going to be in another book. And then once the book's published and you get a paperback copy, it's great holding it in your hands. Um, but the more stories you send out, obviously, the more you'll get picked up. Yeah. As I say, I think you get stronger too. I think that like, by the end of your first year, you look back at some of the first stories you get picked up and you think, Do you know what, that wasn't great or I'd have done this differently or I'd have changed this. But that, that's part of learning, as I say. Same if, if you're, you know, seven or eight years in, most people probably tend to not look back at their earlier stuff unless they're going to tighten it up and re-release it um, because you get better at writing and you start to cringe. Yeah times at some of your own older stuff so but that, that's the reality and I, and I think if you're going to keep at it then you're going to keep learning stuff and you're going to keep looking back and think oh god I should have never done that or that was wrong or, but if you'd never done it at the start you would never get to the stage you're at now so just as I say keep writing keep at it there's a load of open calls if you don't know where to look for them um, you go on Google and search open calls in whatever genre you're looking for you will definitely find some some will be out of date but you know if you go through 10 of them there'll be two or three four good ones in there that you can send away to. um and that, that's it i just keep at it and as i say don't don't be too offended if somebody doesn't like your work <laughs> <laughs> so in your opinion how do you think the horror genre has evolved over the years I think when, when I was, I mean, in the UK, I think it's different for, you know, America because I, I, when Amazon came about, it was good because I could get a lot of books that just weren't available here, you know. In, in the UK at the time, it was Borders was everywhere. Um, and I used to go into Borders and, and the ones that were sort of local to me, they'd loads of Stephen King, loads of Anne Rice, loads of Dean Kuntz and loads of Richard Lehman back at that point. Yeah. Uh, as I say, I read all the Richard Lehmans, loved them. Uh, Stephen King, for, for myself personally, it, it's too long-winded. I don't enjoy King, but as I say, it's just a taste thing. Um, I read a few Kuntz books and, and I didn't enjoy them as much as Lehman. Um, I did enjoy a few James Herbert books. He didn't have as many, obviously, as big a back catalogue. Um, and a few by Sean Hudson, who, again, were, were sort of... You know, you were getting them in the UK, UK authors, but there, there wasn't a wide selection. And then maybe a few anthologies we horror off a hundred years ago. So I, when Amazon came about, it was a bit of a blessing for me because I see, I think it was Dorchester. The Dorchester Publishing was running leisure with their horror imprint and their publishing authors that I mentioned earlier um, and Simon Clark and, and, you know, more sort of up and coming, as I see, I suppose, indie and mid-market authors and I preferred their work. Um, so I read a lot of that and then when Dorchester or Leisure sort of died off, um, I think they just shut down the imprint. And um, again, for a wee while, it was a wee bit bleak. There was a lot of small press publishers and some of them were putting out brilliant books. Cemetery Dance had, had a load of great books back, you know, when I was reading them 20 years ago or whatever. Um, and uh, uh, Subterranean Prey. I can't remember half of the publishers, actually, a lot of them closed, but um, they were about a lot at that time and they were publishing the authors that I really liked, but there was also a lot of sort of signed limited edition books coming out. Um, and I found that obviously postage for America in the UK has always been sort of pricey, but sometimes they were appearing on Amazon and you could get them free delivery for Amazon and things like that, you know, and you could get the books were maybe quite pricey, but it was one of your favourite authors, so it was something else to read by them. Yeah. Um, so I think Amazon opened up the market and then small presses have sort of, I suppose, always been about for every time one shuts down, another one opens, but I think is it's, if, if it's Kindle Direct Publishing opened up and people started um I suppose with with Kindle coming along and becoming so popular, and then again, I, I'd mentioned earlier Jeff Strand. I know I, I read his sort of own writing book a wee while ago. I can't remember the name of it, but he'd mentioned he was one of the sort of first authors to to do, you know, get, get in, involved in the um, the ebooks. There was quite a sort of bad name about it at the time, and I think authors weren't taken too seriously if they were publishing ebooks rather than print books. Um, and there was like Jake and Rath um, and Blake Crouch who are massive these days um, but at the time there was not a lot of people doing it so I remember when I got my first Kindle I'd got a book and it was you know three of them and somebody else had wrote a, a book called Dracula's 
and it was brilliant. And at the time you had the book, and then there was all these sort of cutouts for it and different things at the back. It was almost like when you buy a DVD and there, there's extras. Yeah. There was hundreds of extras at the back of the book as well, which was, was new. Because obviously if you're putting a print book, there's a lot of cost to putting a lot of stuff in the back of it. Yeah. Um, well, there was the weekend also. That probably was a change in the market. You could buy a book for a pound, two pound as well. So you're more likely to try authors you've not tried before. Um, what do you think? And then again, the, the option to self-publish and that allowed other small presses to open up. Um, I think the market was too guarded before and there was a lot of the same authors getting published for years and nobody knew sort of enter on the market and probably a, a part of the reason it died off. So I think it, Kindle's really opened up the market. Um, th there's some amazing stuff coming out over the last 10 years. The, the volume are absolutely brilliant horror. New brilliant writers coming along. Um, it's fantastic. I think the only thing is, is a lot of them come along and they're about for four or five years then they disappear. Um, which is quite disappointing because if you find an author and you love their work and you read five, six, seven, eight of their books and then they just stop writing, it's quite yeah. a sad day. Um, I think, you know, like, look, like, Probably like it's always been in writing, a lot of people don't make the money they want to make quick enough. Um, and then, they, you know, they, 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 they just drop it. Some people have been doing it sort of full time and they go back to work full time instead. Other people have been doing it as a sideline and don't want to lose that amount of time. They'd rather spend it with their family. Um, but I think the horror market's never been more open, as I say. You know, you can publish your own stuff. All I would say is that, um, that there's a... Uh, Quite a wide variety of stuff, you know, from really brilliant to really terrible. Some people put a book out and they don't have it edited, terrible covers, um, you know, and they just sort of die off. But I think that, you know, it's quite easy these days to tell if something's likely to be good. As I say, if you go into a good read that's got hundreds of ratings and it's sitting with a high average rating um, and it's maybe linked to other books you've read and liked, then you, you kind of know there's a chance you're going to like it. And I think because you can buy it in a Kindle instead of a paper, but you can get it for a reasonable price. Yeah. And you've no lost that much if it's no for you. Um, so I, th I think the market's gone amazing at the moment um, I think it would only be sort of changes to Kindle publishing that would probably really upset it now I know when it came along the sort of big publishers didn't think it was going to last I don't think it's going anywhere yeah um, there's a lot of people now um, self-published let me get my words right there's a lot more people self-publishing nowadays than there were like five ten years ago well, this is it, and I think some of the authors that do have contracts with the big publishers also self-publish, so obviously they get a much smaller cut for the big publisher, but obviously the, the advantage is you're back to whatever size of wallet that publisher has and what kind of money they want to throw at marketing you. Um, you need to do everything yourself if you self-publish, obviously, for the, you know, I'm not saying edit it yourself, you know, you pay people to edit it, pay a cover designer to do it, cover, um, but you'll do most of the marketing yourself and promoting it yourself and um, you might have a budget, you might not have a budget. So this, this is the other things that you need to think about if you're going to do it yourself. A lot of people, um, if they don't want to invest that time and effort, would probably need to go down the traditional route. But then again, I think most people tell you these days, you know, even if you go down the traditional route and, um, you know, go through a bigger publisher, you're still having to promote the book yourself as well. You know, they've they've got their top clients that they're probably pumping all the money into. Um, yeah. I think that, you know, you need to be a wee bit of everything, as I say. You need to be able to go into different um, websites and promote it. And if, as I say, that I use mostly Facebook but until I was hacked I was on all the other sites as well um, you know Twitter, TikTok Instagram, there's probably a load that I'm not on but um, I try to kind of keep a wee presence everywhere just to advertise the books as much as possible when I did start out I didn't have a budget um, and I was trying to do everything for as sort of low cost as I could yeah. uh, as I said I worked a day job but you know yourself, you've you know, you, you place, you've got avenues for your money to go um, so I've tried to do it all very low cost and one of the things I suppose you can do yourself is a, a good bit of marketing um, and it's changed through the years you know at the start I had blogs I had a website I tried to set up another website it's, it's been back down I'm not very good with WordPress so stuff like that as I say a bit some of it's trial and error um, some of it works some of it doesn't I've tried advertising on when, when I sort of started putting more money in it on Amazon on Facebook uh, on BookBub yeah. um, 
with varying degrees of success. Some of them being an absolute waste of money and some of them doing quite well. Um, but again, you you need to get to a stage where you can afford to risk whatever you're going to spend in the advertising. I wouldn't have done it at the start because I couldn't afford to take the loss. Um, aye. Yeah, it's um, some people come into into the self publishing world and they think they're going to make a quick book real quick. I it, think it's not case, so. Just because occasionally some authors' first books just take off and they do amazingly well for the first book, and that's brilliant. And, and often when you read those authors' books, you can tell why. You know, you read it and think, well, that was that was great, you know. And then if you read something that's brilliant, you tell your pal that reads, and then they read it, and then they tell somebody. And that, that's why some books are just so good that, that people are going to speak about them. Um, but even at that, they, they needed an initial biting point, you know. They needed normally a really good cover um, to catch your eye, and people say don't judge a book by a cover, but you do. You look at a cover, and sometimes it makes you want to read a book, sometimes it puts you off. Um so I think uh, you need that good cover. And then again, these guys, a lot of them have been clever and, you know, they've maybe advertised the book for months before they even made it go live. So they might be on podcasts talking about the book and, you know, they've maybe paid a wee bit of Facebook advertising and promoted it and things like that. And by the time the book comes out, it straight off the mark sells quite well. If your book does well initially, it goes up the Amazon charts. And the higher you get in the Amazon chart, the more likely you are to stay there. Because when people then see, if you hit first place, other people see you in first place and buy your book. Yeah. You can keep it in first place. Um, and I'm not going to say it's luck because you need to work quite hard to do <laughs> that. But some people get it right. There's probably an element of luck because I'm sure there's some people that have wrote absolutely brilliant books that haven't took off or that haven't had the uh, following that they probably should have. Um so there's probably an element of luck in everything in life. As I say, you could you write something brilliant and just not get it in front of enough people um, to make it the success you want it to be. But again, this is all part of the um, the putting the hours in. At the start, when I was doing it, you know, I'd spend, if I had something new, I'd maybe spend four hours every night on different websites, um, looking for reviewers, just going through the list, looking for horror reviewers. Um, and sometimes you could spend all night and, and no come across an awful lot of reviewers that were for horror. And then uh, maybe 10 that you messaged, you might get one reply. If you're lucky sometimes when you're an unknown author at the start. But again, the more nights you spend four hours doing that and the more groups of people you send it to, the more replies you get, the more uh, reviews you then get on Goodreads or Amazon, then the more people are likely to pick that book up. So there, there's, there's definitely a correlation between putting a lot of time and effort in to being successful. Um, but I think, you know, it never hurts if some, you know, a big named horror author happens to read your book and shout out in their blog or something like that. You know, there's a lot of things that, that can definitely help along the way. But it's just, if you look at the amount of people writing, um, and, you know, you, you need to, I suppose, look at what you're judging as a level of success. You know, if you're talking about the guys that do it full time and make a living from it and they don't work a day job and things like that, that's quite unlikely that you're going to release one book and hit that status. Um, you know, a lot of these guys, maybe even if they had success with the first book, they had to get a second book out there to keep people talking about them, then a third book out. Um, it's a lot of work. You know, and if, if you're going to try and make it a living, it's, it's, it's really a lot of work. As I said, I, I, my books do quite well, and I still work a 40 hour a week job. Yeah, that's right. Well, it's been lovely having you on the show, Kevin. So thank you very much for your time. Thanks for having me. And I hope all your new releases go well. Thank you.